I'm still not used to this new normal and these remote conferences. It's kind of funny to have an audience with people from all over the world, um, but I'll, I'll try to do my best. So, um, so this is some joint work former student at UNL, J.D. Neer, who now is um, a postdoc at the University of Manitoba. Um, so let me start by defining what a covering map is. So this notion arises from topology and in the context of graph theory, a covering map is just a graph homomorphism between two graphs, L and G, um, which is surjective and also locally bijective. And by locally bijective, I mean that for every vertex in L, there's a bijection between the set of edges incident with L and the set of edges incident with its image. So whenever we can find um, such a homomorphism, um, we say that L is a lift of G. So if I can find, find a covering map from L to G, I say that L is a lift of G. And then G is gonna be called the base graph. Okay, so this definition is a lot easier to understand with an example. So if this is my base graph G, um, this graph here L is a lift because this is clearly a, a graph homomorphism. Each of these bins um, is mapped to the vertex with the same color and it's easy to see that it's a homomorphism, it is surjective and also for each vertex V there's a clear bijection um, of the neighborhoods or, or the incident edges. Um, okay, so well I'm going to call, so, th so these bins are called fibers. So for each vertex in the base graph, I have a fiber with all the three images of that vertex. And it's easy to see that for any two fibers that correspond to adjacent vertices in the base graph, I have a perfect matching um, across the fibers. So, well, this, I was talking mainly about um, simple graphs. But this definition can also be extended to base graphs that have loops and multiple edges. Um, so multiple edges don't pose any problem. So if I have a multiple edge here, I just need to add an additional perfect matching across the corresponding fibers. However, for loops, if my base graph ha have a, has a loop, I have to modify a little bit what I mean by um, the covering being a local bijection. But long story short, if you massage the definition appropriately, um, whenever I have a loop in my, in my base graph, this corresponds to a two factor in the corresponding fiber um, in, the, um, in the lift. So you could have these two factor or why not these two factor here. So those, that, that would be a lift um, of this graph. Um, okay, so there, well, here are some very basic properties about lifts. So if my base graph is connected, well, the lift doesn't have to be connected, but all the fibers have the same cardinality. And this um, follows from the, the reason, from what I was mentioning before. So between any two adjacent fibers, I have a perfect matching. So since my base graph is connected, all the fibers have the same cardinality, which could be infinite. And in fact, um, yeah, so there's something called the, um, the universal lift of a graph, which is an infinite tree and has some nice properties. But in this talk, I'm going to focus only um, on finite graphs. So then it makes sense to define an end lift to be a lift where all the fibers have cardinality n. And I could define n lifts for any base graph G, even if it's not connected, um, I can always force all the, all the fibers to have the same size. Okay, um, what else? Well, degrees are preserved by these covering maps. So all the vertices in a fiber have the same degree as their image in the base graph because of the local bijection. Um, so in particular, if my base graph is deregular, any lift 
is also going to be the regular. And here, my loops contribute twice to the degree. There is also a notion of half loop. I don't want to talk much about it. I'll just mention it very briefly. So half loops are like loops that contribute only one to the degree. So you can think of this as a pending edge, but that's not attached to anything else. And the corresponding, I'm not going to define what, um, yeah, covering map means here, but um, a lift of a base graph that has a half loop here would basically, I would have to add a one factor to a corresponding bin. So a one factor would be a matching plus maybe some additional half loops. But I'm going to ignore half loops um, for the rest of the talk. Just wanted to mention their existence. Um, yeah, so we're mainly interested in the chromatic number and see how the chromatic number of a graph and a lift relate to each other. So clearly, the chromatic number can only go up when you take a covering map, because if you have a proper coloring of your base graph, um, well, this is a proper coloring. It's not the best thing because um, this has chromatic number three, but anyways, if you let each fiber inherit the color of the corresponding vertex that gives you a, a proper coloring of the lift. So in particular, but you could be, you could do better. So maybe you could be coloring the lift with fewer colorings, uh, with fewer colors. So we get this inequality um, in general. So um, since we are all interested in probabilistic combinatorics, um, a very natural question is to ask what um, end leaves would look like if you select them at random. So Amit and Lineal introduced in a series of papers the model of um, a random end lift of a graph. And based on what um, I've discussed so far, um, here's the way to build um, a uniform um, random end lift of a graph. So if you give me a graph G, I can replace every vertex by a fiber with um, n vertices. It's just a bin with n vertices. And then replace each edge of the base graph by a perfect matching um, between the fibers chosen uniformly at random. And of course, well, um, you have to um, yeah, do slightly different things if you have, um, well, if you have multiple edges, you just throw additional perfect matchings. And if you have loops, then you throw um, a random two factor here in the, in the fiber. Um, okay, so we're mainly interested in random lifts of D regular graphs. So for D equals six, we could be choosing many different examples of um, six regular base graphs. And for each one, we would have a different model of random lifts. So for instance, this is the bouquet with um, three loops, the complete graph on seven vertices or the bipartite, uh, complete bipartite graph um, K66. They all have degree um, six. And the question is whether the corresponding random models of random loops, um, of random lifts for each of these graphs um, are the same or are very different. So the first observation, and, and this follows by, um, this follows from a paper by Greenhill, um, Jansson, Kim, and Wormel. Um, if you take a random lift of the bouquet on D over two loops, what you get is not quite the uniform model of random D regular graphs, but it is contiguous um, to that model. And here by contiguous, I mean, so two models of random graphs are contiguous if whenever you have a sequence of events that happens asymptotically almost surely in one model, then this happens even only if um, it's also AAS in, in the other model. So maybe the two models are not identical probability spaces, but typical events in one model are typical events in the other model. But if you have a, um, a sequence of events that um, with probabilities 
converging to some non-trivial limit, then this limiting probability might be different in, in, in the two models. Um, okay, so in some sense, if we pick our base graph to be the bouquet, what we get is something that essentially, well, it's contiguous to the uniform model, but this is not the case for the other choices um, of G. So, well, actually it's very easy to see if G is the complete bipartite graph, the random lift is gonna be bipartite as well um, because the chromatic number um, can, can only um, go down when I take the lift. And it's, it's well known that the chromatic number of, of the uniform model is um, of the regular graphs is, well, not two, at least if these large enough. So, but also you can pick any other G and what you'll get is a model that's not contiguous to the uniform model. And the way to see that is if you take the uniform model of random graphs and you consider the event of your random graph being a lift of K7, then with high probability, it will not be. So that's, that's an easy way to, to see that the models are not contiguous. Um, okay, so um, in, in, a, in, a, in a very nice paper by Amit Linial and Matushek, they study many properties concerning the chromatic number and the independence number of random lifts. And they have many open problems and conjectures in that paper that are not um, yet solved. So one of them, and maybe here, what I should have written is at least C times that. So what they say is that if you give me your favorite graph G as a base graph, a run, the chromatic number of a random list um, lift um, with asymptotically almost surely is at least some universal constant times this. So the chromatic number of G divided by the log. Um, so there are no ends here. Um, G is a fixed graph. And in fact, they, they prove the following. So they give an upper bound for every graph G, the chromatic number of, the, um, of a random lift is at most, um, well, um, delta over log delta, where delta is the maximum degree of G, and it's at least um, the square root of the chromatic number of G divided by the log. And in fact, if you replace chromatic number by fractional chromatic number, you can get rid of the square root, but you have to add an extra log. Um, so, well, in particular, but for the particular case where G is a complete graph that's on D plus one vertices, so it's deregular, for, for, for G being the complete graph, um, oh, sorry, I, I forget, there's always constants here. Um, so if G is the complete graph, they, they show that this is the right um, value for the chromatic number of the random lift. Well, and the same here, I think here. Anyways, I made a mess, but um, long story short, um, they conjecture this, that this um, lower bound is true for every graph um, but they, and they have some partial results. Um, also, well, the result on G being the complete graph does not try to optimize these constants. So it'd be nice to characterize the chromatic number of a random lift of, a, of the complete graph. And in fact, the first non-trivial case is when G is K5. For, for G equals um, K4, um, clearly the the random lift is not bipartite, and since it has degree three, um, then the chromatic number would be three. Um, but for, yes, yeah, so if you take the random lift of K5, well, clearly the chromatic number must be um, in this range, but it's not known what it is. And in fact, there's a paper by um, Farzad and 
ties or thighs that studies the case where G is the complete graph minus one edge and shows that um, the chromatic number of the, com of the random lift um, would be three. So that was our motivation. So we wanted to study the chromatic number of the random lift of a complete graph. But before I talk about our results, there's another conjecture in that paper that says that for every, you fix your favorite graph G, um, the chromatic number of the random lift should be concentrated AAS in one single value. So there should be a one point concentration. So I think that's a, a very um, strong conjecture because that's not even known um, for the uniform model for, well, like, uh, unless like um, D is very large. Okay, so there are many other open questions in that paper. Um, so what we proved with JD is that if you give me any fixed D, you, we can compute a K, K sub D, I don't care about this definition, but K of D is roughly D over um, two log D, um, such that the chromatic lift, I sorry, the chromatic number of a random lift of the complete D regular graph is AAS in this um, two, two value window. So we, we prove a two, um, a two point concentration. And in fact, for half of the values of D, um, whatever that means, for roughly half of the integers, we can get rid of this number and show that the random lift um, has chromatic number AAS KD. Um, so I want to say a few more things about the result. First of all, our upper bound, um, which is this, or in some, for some of these, this, is also valid not just for the um, random lift of a complete graph, but for the random lift of any deregular graph, which is nice. So in some sense, um, you could take your deregular graph to be again, a bouquet with D over two loops or the complete graph or other things like this complete bipartite graph. However, this upper bound can be very far from um, being tied because in this case, since this graph is bipartite, a random lift will also be bipartite. So our upper bound is kind of far from the truth. But what we're saying is that at least for the random lift of the complete graph, we get the uh, essentially the right chromatic number. So this relates, so if you wonder what happens if I take um, G to be the, the bouquet. So a few years ago with Graham Kempkes and Nick Wormel, we, um, yeah, we determined the chromatic number of the uniform model for the regular graphs. Um, well, we got the exact same result. So if you replace here, um, yeah, like a random lift by um, a uniform deregular graph, um, we get the same result. So in some sense, now, if you think of um, uniform deregular graphs as random lifts of the bouquet, we have this kind of essentially best possible result for random lift of bouquets and complete graphs. And we have an upper bound that works for every deregular G. So, so that's the, um, the current status of, of the project. So our result um, for the uniform model was improved by Koya, Oakland, FTMU, and Hederich um, by basically they say that you can drop this value in, um, here for D larger than some huge D naught. And what they do, they do some sort of, um, well, second moment argument, but instead of looking at the colorings, they look at the clusters um, in the space of, of color assignments. So they, they run a second moment argument on, on the clusters instead of the colors. Okay, so, so this is what we did. Um, so in some sense, we're trying to generalize things from the uniform uh, model of the regular graphs to uh, um, a more general model that um, 
where we can pick um, any deregular um, base graph. Okay, so this is just the, the main set of tools that we use. I think the first time I prepared the slides, I don't remember for which talk it was, but I was trying to um, impress people by listing lots of tools. Um, but then if I wanna be more modest, I could just say that, uh, well, the main tool that we use is a first and second moment argument. However, to compute the moments, we need to work very hard. So this is essentially a first and second moment argument. So I'm gonna talk about some of these tools um, in the next slides, but so we use the small subgraph conditioning method developed by Robinson and Wormald. We have to do some optimization um, that for, yeah, for anyone who's familiar with that paper of Acleoptas and Naor, where they look at the chromatic number of GNP for um, constant average degree, um, they do some sort of optimization over the set of square stochastic matrices. We have to extend the results to rectangular matrices. So in some sense, we, we, we have to generalize some of the ideas in that paper. Um, yeah, we use also some complex analysis and some um, other things. And something I was very excited about, um, there's some algebraic graph theory. I used to know close to nothing about algebraic graph theory. So I was learning some things from this project. So um, I don't know, I just found it exciting, but probably um, everything that I learned is probably trivial, but um, yeah, anyway, I had a, a good time. Um, so here's the, well, the main idea behind the proof, as I said, it's a second, a first and second moment argument. So to lower bound the chromatic number, you just wanna um, count the number of K colorings of, of a random lift and, and then show that if your number of colors is too small, then the expected number of proper colorings goes to zero and therefore, um, with high probability, you have no proper K coloring. So that's just the first moment argument. For the second moment, uh, like for the upper bound on the chromatic number, we wanna show that some um, proper colorings exist. We're gonna hurt ourselves by restricting our attention to strongly equitable colorings. So a coloring is strongly equitable if each fiber, um, well, in each fiber, you see the same number of vertices of each color, maybe plus minus one. So, of course, we are restricting the colorings that we're looking at, but we believe that those ones are the, the most common ones. So we're hoping that we're not losing much. So then um, what we do is show that if we, you have enough colors, the second moment is of the same order as the square of the first moment, and then by the well, well-known um, paley zygmunt inequality, the probability of having at least one uh, proper strongly equitable coloring um, is at least this ratio, which is a constant um, greater than zero. So unfortunately, so if this constant was one, we would be happy. So we would have shown that with high probability, you have some um, proper K colorings, but this constant that we get is less than zero because of, I'll talk about this later. Um, in some sense, the existence of short cycles, um, well, like the, the, the short cycle counts kind of fluct fluctuate and these affect um, your variance. And, and that's what um, yeah, makes this constant not be um, one. I wanted to also mention something for people that have um, solved similar problems, typically computing the second moment is much harder than computing the first moment. But this was not um, the case here. Um, so, well, some aspects in the computation of this first moment were harder than the computation of this second moment. Well, that's because it's two different random variables. So here we are forcing, we're restricting ourselves to strongly equitable colorings. Um, and in some sense, um, I'll say more later on, but this calculation really looked like 
a second moment calculation. So it's a first moment calculation, but we use lots of ingredients from that paper by Akliotis and Naor from their second moment calculations to compute this expectation, and at least for the optimization part. Um, there are other aspects that are harder here, but that was a bit surprising that um, we, we had to work quite hard to compute this expectation. Um, okay, so let me say a little bit more. So for people that have never computed this kind of moments for problems like that, I just want to give you a, a high level explanation of what needs to be done and the tools that appear. Um, I'm not going to get into any gory details. Um, we would like, well, to compute the expected number of colorings, you just want to count the, um, the number of pairs, lift and color, and divide by the total number of lifts. So you want to count the number of pairs, lift and color, where, where C is a proper coloring of the lift and divide by, by the total number of lifts. So for this, um, to compute this numerator, it's a lot easier to fix the coloring first and then try to count how many lifts are compatible with that color. So the idea is to then um, write this expectation by considering some parameters in some range and for each particular value of the parameters, um, I should get an easy count. So let me talk about these parameters a little bit from a high level point of view. So for each fiber, I want to specify some A's that tell me the number of vertices in the fiber that receive um, each of the colors. In fact, I want to normalize that by the number of colors. So you can think of these A's as proportions. So that's the fraction of uh, vertices in the fiber of each color. So you can think of that also as a probability distribution. And you have a set of A's, well, a distribution for each fiber. And then for any two consecutive fibers, I want to specify some parameters called the B's that tell me which proportion of the edges go from, let's say, yellow to blue, yellow to red, yellow to green, um, etc. Of course, no yellow to yellow because I want to, um, well, I want the, the coloring to be proper. So if I specify for each fiber the A's, and for each pair of adjacent fibers, I give you the Bs, um, some valid um, values of the A's and the Bs, then counting the contribution to the expectation or maybe to this numerator is very easy. Um, it's just a bunch of multinomials and, and factorials and uh, like it's ugly, but, but not that that scary. So if I specify how many vertices of each color go here, how many vertices of each color, how many edges of each type, you just need to throw the matchings so that you respect um, those constraints. Um, but I'm more interested about where these parameters live. Um, so, well, first of all, the A's and the B's were proportions. So if I multiply them times n, I get integers, because those were quantities divided by n. So they live in this lattice. So you just should remember the word lattice. So, so the a's and the b's live in, in some lattice, because once you multiply them times n are integers. Um, they also satisfy, well, some inequality constraints, because you can think of them as probability distributions. For each fiber, all the a's add to one, and they're not negative. For each pair of adjacent fibers, the Bs also add a probability distribution. So they live in this polytop determined by, by these inequality constraints. And also there are some equality constraints. Well, the sum of the A's in each fiber is one. Those are just proportions of different colors in the fiber. And for each two adjacent fibers, um, well, so if I sum these Vs here, those are edges that go from yellow to blue, yellow to red, yellow to green. The sum should give me the number of yellow vertices. So that's this constraint here. And we get something um, similar, some that relate 
the Bs to the As of the other fiber here. So um, let me repeat that. My parameters live in some lattice, live in some polytop, and also satisfy some equality constraints, which means they live in some affine um, space. So they live in the intersection of a polytop, a lattice, and an affine space. And for each valid set of parameters in, in this domain, computing the contribution to the expectation is, is, is just um, an easy combinatorial exercise. Okay, so let me say something else. So if you, you can lay down um, maybe it's more like this. You can write the A's um, as, as for each fiber, um, yeah, you have a fiber for each vertex of the base graph. Um, you can lay down the A's. So each row of my matrix, I get a matrix that where each row is a probability distribution. So I get a stochastic matrix with as many rows as the as vertices in the base graph and one column for each color. So you have k columns and, and these many rows. It's a stochastic matrix, but it's not square in general, it's rectangular. So um, in order to estimate this moment, we had to optimize this term over all possible values of the a's and the b's. And at some point this boiled down to some optimization problem over stochastic matrices, um, which was similar to what Acleoptas and Naur did, but in their case, um, their matrices are square. So we, um, I'll, I'll talk, well, so all I wanted to say is that, um, yeah, so our optimization, so what I wanna say, yeah, is that in Acleoptas and Naur problem, these matrices were square k by k because they arose from calculations involving the second moment where you have two colorings. But in our case, what I wanted to say is that the fibers play a similar role as the colors. So this in some sense looks like a second moment calculation. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to say, maybe not very successfully. Um, but in any case, what we showed is that the main contribution to this first moment comes from the most symmetric term where all the A's, for every fiber, all the A's are equal to one over K and all the B's are also equal to one over K times K minus one. Um, okay, so let me say a bit more about how to compute um, moments that look like this. And here I'm gonna do that in general. So M could be either a first or a second moment. Um, and we typically, as I said, we get a sum over um, some parameters living in some space, um, which is the intersection of a polytop, um, a lattice and some affine space. So yeah, so this lattice lives, well, it, so yeah, if we have d parameters, so this um, domain lives in, in Rn, but we're intersecting it with a polytop, some affine space, and some lattice. So these parameters, when multiplied times n, give me integers. So typically, once you fix a feasible value of these parameters, contributing the, co computing the contribution to the moment, as I said, it's, is easy. Usually you get factorials and multinomials and things like that, so you can, approximate that using Stirling's formula, and you always get something that looks like this. So there's an exponential part where you can factor out an n here and get some kind of function that does not contain n's, which is defined in your polytop times some polynomial factor. So if you only cared about the exponential behavior of the moment, it's enough if you can maximize, if you have this function f and you can maximize that in, well, in your domain or even in just in the polytop, 
um, so that you can find some x naught here that's a, a unique um, global maximum of the function, then, well, you can basically say that the, contri the exponential contribution um, to this sum comes from the term corresponding to x naught because, well, you have some polynomial factor and the number of terms in this sum is also polynomial. Um, it's at most um, something like n to the d. So the sum is at most some polynomial times um, the term corresponding to x naught. So you get something like this. And in fact, this sum is at least the term corresponding to x naught, which is of the same nature. So you can very easily um, characterize um, the exponential behavior of, of the moments, provided that you can um, maximize this function. And that's what I was talking about before. Um, it, we had to maximize some very complicated function over um, the set of rectangular stochastic matrices. And this was complicated because we had to generalize um, some already pretty complicated results. But that's not enough. So we would like a more precise estimation for the moments. We would like to recover um, the polynomial factors. And there are different methods to do that, but the result is always the same. So the whole sum is going to be, well, so you don't need to sum over the whole domain. The whole sum is typically given by a vicinity of this um, term of maximum exponential distribution. So basically you just need to sum over a little area around. And basically what you get is that the sum is the largest term times some correction factor, which is n to the r over two. Where these r here um, is the dimension of the affine space um, that you had here. So the dimension of the kernel of this matrix. So you're slicing your um, polytop by an affine space of dimension r. So that's the r that appears here. So um, if you want a trivial example, if we were to sum the binomial coefficients, which um, oh, everybody knows that this is two to the n, but we could just say that this is you can just look for the term that gives you the maximum exponential contribution, which is when I, when I equals n um, over two, and we add a correction of the square root of n times some constant, where this square root of n, like this one here, is just the dimension of our domain of summation. Of summation. So, um, so this is like a, a trivial example of the situation that occurs. But we also want to compute this constant C. And we know of two methods for doing that. Either there are some Laplace summation techniques and some saddle point integration method that uses generating functions and some complex analysis. I'm not gonna say much about that, um, but we use both methods in the paper actual, actually several times. We need to do this kind of thing several times and then Sometimes we use one method, sometimes the other, because it's not always um, easy. Um, something about this constant. Um, so if you use this Laplace summation technique, I don't wanna give you um, all the gory details because it's a, if I give you the theorem, it's like a, a one page uh, theorem, but this constant can be written as a function of several things. Um, as the Hessian of this function here at x naught, but the Hessian restricted to the subspace. So if you compute the Hessian of this function at, at the maximum of the function and, and restrict that to subspace, and you if you can also compute the volume of the fundamental cell of the lattice, then you can compute the constant C. So, this fundamental lattice, well, this lattice, the fundamental cell originally has volume one, but when you slice it by the subspace, that changes. So, um, so it takes some work to compute these things. And we just realized, 
Oh, so we so this approach um, follows some ideas in a paper by Greenfield, Janssen, and Ruchinsky, but we realized that well that we do, we don't like lattices, so um, that you can reformulate the volume of this fundamental lattice um, in terms of counting spanning trees of a certain graph. So maybe that's well known, but we didn't know that. So we find we we thought that that was cool. So instead of looking at the fundamentals um, at the volume of this fundamental cell, we look at an auxiliary graph that we call gamma, which is the graph that has incidence matrix V. So given by the constraints in my domain, so the equations um, become uh, vertices and the variables become edges. Um, so if you count spanning trees in this graph that comes from the constraints or maximal spanning forests, then um, you can obtain the volume of this fundamental cell. And that was fun because, um, well, we turned that into, yeah, a problem of counting um, spanning trees. So we could use the, the matrix uh, tree theorem. We had to understand what this auxiliary graph looks like. It, it has to do with the constraints um, of the um, optimization problem. So it has nothing to do, well, so it's not the, the base graph or anything like that. It, it comes from the constraints in the optimization problem. Um, okay, so I guess I have like five minutes left. Um, five or a bit more. Okay, yeah, so it should be okay. So, so that's what we do. So we successfully compute the expectation of X and the expectation and second moment of Y, where X counts colorings and Y counts um, strongly equitable colorings. Um, this is a lot of work, but, um, but it works. Unfortunately, the ratio between, um, let me get this right, I always get this wrong. Um, the ratio between the square of the first moment and the second moment, as I said, tends to a constant, which is unfortunately less than one. So, and so this gives us um, an upper bound on the probability of having some, some strongly balanced colorings. So, so we, uh, sorry, no, that's better, we're sad. Um, so the problem is the effect of um, short cycles. And for those who are not familiar with the small subgraph conditioning method, um, I'm just gonna give you an intuitive idea of, of what's going on. So I claim that this second moment is affected by the fluctuations due to um, short cycles. So if you define Z sub I to be the number of cycles of length I, well, it's well known for, well, well, for lifts as well, um, these cycle counts are asymptotically Poisson and asymptotically independent. So they behave in the limit like a Poisson of some parameter lambda i. Um, so you can look at your probability space and slice it according to the cycle counts. So here in this particular slice, I'm basically looking at the slice of the probability space where I'm conditioning on the number of triangles being seven, the number of four cycles being zero, the number of five cycles being two, et cetera, maybe up to the number of cycles of length 100 being 29. So what I claim is that if you look at these lies and you compute also this ratio, but con in conditional to being on that slice, you get a different C, um, which is closer to one. So you get a, a different C like in this um, conditional probability spaces that's closer to one. And in fact, you can make this C 10 to one by making um, 100 10 to infinity. So in other words, if I condition to the cycle counts of longer and longer cycles, I can make this get closer and closer to one. So this gives me an intuition um, of why um, well, so so why then this is so this is going to um, work? Because then, like in theory, by specifying more and more um, cycle counts, you can boost the probability of having 
uh, proper K coloring and make it as close as you want to one. So this is the main idea. But if you want to apply the method as a toolbox, um, this is what you need to do. Um, so, well, we agreed that the cycle counts were Poisson in the limit. Um, it turns out that, well, let me just say, suppose that you compute, no, maybe I'll, I'll say it in a different way. Suppose that you consider a different probability space in which instead of picking the random lifts unif uniformly, you weight them by Y. So the weight um, that you pick a random lift is proportional to the number of um, colorings it has. So in this weighted probability space, it turns out that the cycle counts are still Poisson for some different parameters. How do you show that? Well, this is nothing, this that the expected number of cycles of length i in this weighted probability space. So if you do, if you compute these expectations and the uh, joint factorial moments, um, I was lazy about writing this, um, y times, well, I'm very lazy about writing these. I don't wanna, well, but if you compute the joint factorial moments in this weight, um, space, you also conclude that the cycle counts are Poisson with different parameters. And now you do some magic. So you compute the exponential of this sum here, of this series with the lambdas and the deltas that came from here and there, and you get some number. If this number matches the constant that you got from the ratio between um, the two moments, then you can conclude that the heuristic I gave before works. So um, the probability of having at least a, a, a proper coloring goes to one. And in some sense, you also get that the weighted space and the unweighted space are contiguous. So this originates from a paper by Robinson and Wormel. It was so a more general result or, or method then um, was, uh, appears in a paper by, by Janssen. So this is, this is the idea. Um, and I just wanna use a couple more minutes. So now we've computed the moments of the X and the Y, but now, well, it turns out that we have to compute more moments here. So there's more work that needs to be done. These, these kind of joint moments that are weighted, um, what I'm weighting, um, well, the cycle counts by Y. So in particular, um, everything boils down to understanding, um, well, how short cycles behave. So a lot of this work um, requires us to know how many, well, yeah, how many cycles of different lengths we have in a, in a random lift. Um, so to do that, we need to understand also how, like if I, if I give you a length L, for instance, L equals six, how many different patterns of a, cycle, of a cycle of length six can I have in my random lift? So this is a cycle of length six, which I'm orienting. So, but it could, well, it could have a different shape. So here I'm, I'm going to these bins, I'm revisiting this fiber, revisiting this fiber and going back. So I would like to understand in a, in a lift of, of a graph, how many um, cycles of different lengths can I have in order to, com to, to compute these moments here. So, if you assign, if you orient these cycles and then just forget about the individual vertices of the lift and look at the base graph, you can think of this cycle as a non-backtracking closed walk in the base graph. So if I just can look at the fibers I'm visiting, so this is a closed walk, but it's not backtracking. And by non-backtracking, I mean that I can I can revisit, so here I'm revisiting this fiber and this fiber, but I cannot take a sharp U-turn. So this is a sharp 
U-turn in a non-backtracking. Um, no, so, so this is a sharp U-turn. So this is non-back. See, this is backtracking. And the reason I cannot do that is because remember that in my lift, I'll have a perfect matching between two fibers. So there's no way I can, um, yeah, like go along a matching and come back without reusing the same edge. So what I'm trying to say, maybe not very successfully, is that in order to understand um, cycles of length L in, in a lift, you need to understand um, non-backtracking close walks um, in the base graph. So you can use some Markov chain arguments to, um, to count. Well, I, I don't want to say much about that, but um, I just want to say that there's a lot of theory developed about that. So there's some very nice papers by Friedman and other people that if you think um, that relate non-backtracking walks um, to the backtracking ones. So if you think this of this as a, um, as a random walk on, on the base graph, but you want it to be um, non-backtracking. So if you understand the transition probability matrix of, of the, um, well, of, of a simple random walk or, on a graph, you can define um, very easily a non-backtracking random walk on a different set of spaces, on a different set of states, and the eigenvalues of the two transition matrices are related by some formula. So these appears in, 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 in this paper and others. So there's a nice relation between the eigenvalues of the transition matrix of a random walk on a graph and the corresponding non-backtracking one. So we use all that in some sense to count, um, well, to, to count these expectations uh, and, and these ones. So the, the expected number of um, cycles of different lengths in, in our random lift. And I think this is it. So, well, this is just a summary of some of the very nice open problems in that paper um, by Amit Linil and Matushek. There are other problems that don't involve the chromatic number. So maybe I'll just add some current work. Um, we are now trying to understand with the student how Hamilton cycles behave in that model. There's a paper by um, Wuchek, I'm not sure about the name, Win, Vinkovsky and Vinkovsky, I'm not sure if I'm saying the names right, with some partial results about um, the existence of Hamilton cycles in random lifts and we're trying to extend that. And there's a lot of work. So if you like the uniform model of deregular graphs, um, you can think of random lifts as a very nice non-trivial generalization. So, um, so it's interesting to, to try to extend results um, from the uniform model to, to random lifts of, of regular graphs. And I think I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'm going to finish here. Thank you very much uh, for uh, the very nice talk and very deep explanation of the proof. Uh, any questions? There's a question in the chat. Um, oh, for the conjecture, da, da, da. is this the same bound? Um, well, there's an upper bound in terms of the degree of the, so maybe, I don't know if that's still in the slides or not. Maybe I deleted that. Yeah, it's here. I don't know if people can see that. So their upper bound is in terms of the, of the maximum degree of the graph. So it's not in terms of the chromatic number, um, but at least, well, for complete graphs, um, they coincide. So I don't think they have an upper bound in terms of the chromatic number. Um, well, other than the trivial one, you can just place the chromatic number here. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Jane asking what was the lower bound? Oh. Um, oh, for what is known? Well, just for complete graphs. 
Well, and of course for the bouquet. Um, yeah, just for complete graphs, I think. Um, I'm pretty sure that maybe, like if you don't care about these um, constants here and you want just, um, well, like the main asymptotic in terms of maybe the chromatic number or, or the degree, you can probably uh, find easy generalizations to larger families of graphs. But I, I didn't, I was more interested in finding um, exact results. So I was really wanting to give the exact number, not so much proving this kind of bounds. So in fact, um, I would like, so maybe I give that as an open problem. So these, things that we get here are a valid upper bound for every lift of a deregular graph. Um, I would like to know for which families of deregular graphs um, the lower bound that we get is also um, optimal. So of course it works for the bouquet <clears throat> and, and the complete graph, but I would like to see if there's any sort of graphs with some symmetry, maybe if your base graph, I don't know, um, it's kind of complete bipartite in some sense, but maybe here has some little clicks, like something that's very symmetric <coughs> in many ways, because <coughs> the place where our argument for the lower bound breaks down is when you're trying to estimate these moments, we use lots of inequalities that rely on the symmetry of the base graph. So maybe for more general, but very symmetric base graphs, um, some of, um, well, our argument might, might still be true. So um, I have a question. So uh, does your theorem interesting when D is large? So uh, maybe I missed something here, so. Um, oh, our results are always for fixed D? Yes. So, but for, for large T, there, are, there, is a, there is a more interesting result, right? Well, um, for, for, for large D, this is known for the uniform model, that uh -huh. for large D, um, you have a, a one point concentration. Oh, okay. I'm pretty sure that the same is gonna be true for the random lifts. Okay. okay. Um, using, um, the, well, the same type of analysis like, um, cluster analysis in, in, in that paper. Maybe I'm just not that comfortable. Those things also get very technical. So yeah, like we didn't pursue that, but I'm pretty sure that if you um, replace these three by a, a sufficiently large constant, I'm pretty sure that this is true. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, I just, yeah, don't wanna, don't wanna work so hard. Yeah, I think we are completely out of time, but maybe you can shortly explain what uh, more precisely what this half of the D means. Uh, maybe you can, can you prove something precise, more precise here. More precisely, what sorry? About the half of the D. Uh, uh, half about, of the D which you have exactly oh, key. Oh, the, the, the half loops? No, 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 that for half of D's you have exactly. Ah, oh, oh, okay, yeah, so sure. So um, I don't remember by heart, but there's a condition that says, um, so you, you can compute K sub D as the smallest K satisfying that. So then there's another condition um, if, I don't remember the, the relation, but it's, it's a bound that looks qualitatively like this. So I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna make up something that's completely um, wrong, but I don't know or something like that, log 2k. Well, so if some other, like if this k and this is satisfy some other condition, which I don't know by heart, then you can remove that. And then it's very easy to see that, um, yeah, I'll just delete that because it's completely wrong. If you look so at what this bound- on interval somehow. Of yeah, so there are some intervals. Um, you can partition the line into some intervals where in these intervals you have a two point um, concentration and, and, and these ones are one point and roughly the length of these intervals is the same. So mm -hmm. it, 
intervals kind of grow, but any two consecutive intervals are comparable. So half of the integers uh, fall into these dark intervals and the other half into these um, dark, um, well, wide ones. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, Xavier. Yeah? <laughs> Sorry, it's me. Uh, so just wonder if this uh, problem have been studied for some other class of families rather than clicks? Um, well, other than that paper that studies this base graph, I'm not aware of any paper. Um, mm. For these kind of counting arguments, symmetries are very important. But, oh no, actually there are some papers for general G. So there are some papers that um, prove the existence of a Hamilton cycle and these kind of things using expansion properties and postal rotation kind of arguments that all you need is the degrees to be large enough so that the graph expands. So whenever you're not going for such tight results and you just um, want the degrees to be large, there are some papers for general Gs. But our problem, our methods are essentially counting arguments and, and we really rely on well-behaved and symmetric base graphs. I see. So, so if, if the goal is to actually try to um, characterize or find some families of G for which the chromatic number of the lift is, um, the, the magnitude of the chromatic number is of order, you know, chromatic number of G over log of chromatic number of G, then probably the, for the upper bound, it's possible to use some kind of coloring scheme um, to, do, to do it instead of using uh, second moment calculation. Oh, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, um, sure. Do you know if there is some work like that? Um, or maybe like analyzing some greedy algorithm? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, there's, there are a lot of, there are many little results in that paper by Amit Lineal and Matushek, um, but I haven't looked at the paper for a while, so I, I don't remember all the things that they do. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Excuse and me for the noisy background. <laughs> okay. Jane, maybe you can prove some sort of sandwich uh, theorem for D going to infinity. Yeah, but I'm not sure this model, it, it looks a bit like D regular, right? But I think, I think it's, it's not going to be similar to GMP at all because you, you have this large independent, like a batch, oh, no, like but independent you can, sets, right? You so it's very the, different from any random graph model. Fibers, and you can throw edges in the fiber with some probability. Yeah. Yeah, my, my sus I suspect it's very different from any okay. of the random graph model we know how to analyze, like GMP. So no sandwich then. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much, Xavier, and uh, thanks all uh, the speakers and all participants who, who listened to, to the talks. Yeah, hope next time uh, we will have better environment to have it in Moscow.